The open borders argument has been unfairly maligned as either an insane leftist talking point or a grift by big businesses to depreciate wages. In reality, borders are a moral evil that should be immediately abolished. Here's why. The waters are muddied on this issue by arguments analysing whether open borders work and whether they maximise some manner of economic goodies which the author cares about. I will not be making such an argument. My argument will be a moral one, not one based on some arbitrarily selected effects that open borders will have. In short, open borders aren't good because they work, they work because they're good. The reason for this is quite simply that the state does not own the land that it rules over, and thus it has no right to decide who's allowed to enter or not. Consider Crusoe on Friday on a desert island. How is it that either man could come to own some land? There are two basic theories that we might adopt here. Either one, they come to own land via original appropriation, that is the locking idea of mixing labour, described more precisely in terms of initially taking possession of some scarce good, or two, they come to own land via mere verbal declaration or decree. The problem with this second option is that it implies an arbitrary and impossible to follow system of property rights. This is because mere verbal declaration does not and cannot establish an objective property border that all can see such that conflicts may be avoided. Consider if Crusoe wanted to own a hill on the island, so he just shouts to the forest that he now owns this hill. If Friday comes along later, he has no means of determining Crusoe's supposed property right in this hill, and as such, the property right does not exist as conflicts over its use cannot be avoided. I go over this point more heavily in my course on liberty and ethics, which you can read for free, but in short, the purpose of law is to determine an arrangement of property rights where property rights are conflict-avoiding norms, and conflict is defined as contradictory actions. So if Crusoe is using a stick, and Friday tries to use that same stick, there is a conflict over the use of it. Thus, law must assign a property right denoting who has the right to control the stick and exclude others from doing so. We have seen that assigning property rights via mere verbal decree cannot avoid conflicts, so we're left with only the option that property right is assigned to the person who initially appropriated the good from nature. This state performed no such appropriation. There are vast swaths of many countries which are completely untouched by man. Surely if a Martian were to fly a ship and touch it down in rural Siberia, there are many places where he could do so where no man had ever set foot before. Yet the Russian government would claim that he is trespassing on their land. Thus, states assert that they gain property right by fiat by merely decreeing that they own a given thing, rather than actually going out and appropriating that thing from nature. Thus the open border stance, also called the free immigration stance, which holds that the state does not have a right to prevent any immigration, is correct. Some will take umbrage with the nomenclature, claiming that the correct stance is not one of open state borders, but of closed or restricted private property borders. These people are simply confused. The open border stance is the one which supports private property. Nobody thinks that open borders means that trespassing on your neighbour's lawn is no longer a crime. This is a straw man against the open borders position. Thus, I am fundamentally an advocate of open borders or free immigration. I will not slink away from this stance, nor will I adjust my speech to say that, um, actually, I am an advocate of private property borders. There are a number of potential counters to my thesis here. The first of which is that there's such a thing as a social contract, which all men agree to as part of their participation in society. And this contract is supposed to grant the state the right to exclude people from communally held land on the citizen's behalf. Such a notion is ludicrous on every level of analysis. First, I recall signing no such contract, nor does anyone else, and no notion of implicit consent can be used to save this notion because we know there are a group of people called anarchists who explicitly don't consent to the actions the state takes on their behalf. If a man is explicitly not consenting, how could it possibly be that he's implicitly consenting? Second, a contract defines a set of transfers of title to property. If nobody owns the land in rural Siberia in the first place, how could title to it possibly be transferred to anyone, including the state? Moreover, even if this social contract is thought of not as a regular contract, but as a method for the citizens to delegate their rights to the state, then this point is still not saved, as none of the citizens had the right to exclude people from appropriating or entering the land in rural Siberia, as none of them owned this land. Third, this social contract requires a notion of group property, but group property implies a contradiction. To show why, I quote from my course. Now that we have a theory of property that accounts for both self-ownership and external ownership, we can begin to address some implications of this theory. The first of which is that ownership is necessarily individual. That is, group ownership is strictly impossible. Consider a set of people, A through Z, who each commonly own a stick. What is to be done about conflict over the use of this stick between A and B? There are two possibilities. Either A is said to be the just victor, or B is. If A, then he owns the stick and B does not. If B, then he owns the stick and A does not. But both options contradict the presumption that every member in the set owned the stick. 
Therefore, group ownership simply cannot occur. There are a number of supposed counterexamples to this thesis, but I demonstrate the falsehood of each of them in the course, so I will not go over them here. So the notion of a social contract cannot serve to justify immigration restrictions, but there's a purported natural rights defence of restricted borders forwarded by Hans Hermann Hoppe. The phenomena of trade and immigration are different in a fundamental respect, and the meaning of free and restricted in conjunction with both terms is categorically different. People can move and migrate, goods and services of themselves cannot. Put differently, while someone can migrate from one place to another without anyone else wanting him to do so, goods and services cannot be shipped from place to place unless both sender and receiver agree. Trivial as this distinction may appear, it has momentous consequences. For free in conjunction with trade means trade by invitation of private households and firms only. And restricted trade does not mean protection of households and firms from uninvited goods or services, but invasion and abrogation of the right of private households and firms to extend or deny invitations to their own property. In contrast, free in conjunction with immigration does not mean immigration by invitation of individual households and firms, but unwanted invasion or forced integration. And restricted immigration actually means, or at least can mean, the protection of private households and firms from unwanted invasion and forced integration. Hence, in advocating free trade and restricted immigration, one follows the same principle, requiring an invitation for people as for goods and services. But this invitation requirement certainly does not apply to that unowned land in rural Siberia, Nobody owns this land, and as such, the Martian or other immigrants require nobody else's permission to go there. It is certainly the case, however, that invitation or permission is required before going onto the actual property of others, but this is not in dispute by anyone. It has never been forwarded by any open borders advocate that open borders means that trespass is no longer a crime. Rather, open borders specifically means that the government does not have a right to restrict immigration from outside of that country to inside of it. Block highlights this with an analogy to domestic migration. I shall contend that emigration, migration and immigration all fall under the rubric of victimless crime. That is, not a one of these three per se violates the non-aggression axiom. Therefore, at least for the libertarian, no restrictions or prohibitions whatsoever should be placed in the path of these essentially peaceful activities. Immigration across national boundaries should be analysed in an identical manner to that migration which takes place within a country. If it is non-invasive for Jones to change his locale from one place in Misesania to another in that country, then it cannot be invasive for him to move from Rothbardania to Misesania. Alternatively, if migration across international borders is somehow illegal legitimate. This should apply to the domestic variety as well. As long as the immigrant moves to a place of private property whose owner is willing to take him in, maybe for a fee, there can be nothing untoward about such a transaction. This, along with all other capitalist acts between consenting adults, must be considered valid in the libertarian world. Note that there is no freedom of movement of the person per se. This is always subject to the willingness of property owners in the host nation to accept the immigrant onto their land. So if the Hoppian stance is taken to mean only that borders are restricted to the extent required by individual property owners, this is fine, but this unobjectionable thesis has been used to spiral out way beyond this point. Moreover, hand in hand with the institution of a government comes the institution of public property and goods. That is, of all property and goods owned collectively by all domestic residents and controlled and administered by the government. The larger or smaller the amount of public government ownership, the greater or lesser will be the potential problem of forced integration. In non-socialist countries such as the US, Switzerland and the Federal Republic of Germany, which are favourite immigration destinations, a government admitted immigrant could not move just anywhere. The immigrant's freedom of movement would be severely restricted by the extent of private property, and private land ownership in particular. Yet, by proceeding on public roads or with public means of transportation, and then staying on the public land and in public parks and buildings, an immigrant can potentially cross every domestic resident's path, even move into anyone's immediate neighbourhood and practically onto his very doorsteps. The smaller the quantity of public property, the less acute this problem will be, but as long as there exists any public property, it cannot be entirely escaped. So we see here that Hoppe is not classing forced integration as merely those instances where an immigrant is literally trespassing on some individual's private property, but also of those instances where an immigrant merely crosses the path of a private property owner over some public possession that the owner is situated near. But this path crossing does not imply that the immigrant has violated anybody's rights. After all, is it a criminal act for a man from Michigan to use roads in Ohio or Indiana? Clearly not. There is no such thing as a collective property right. It is not the case that the tax paying collective comes to own such a collective property right in those goods produced by stolen tax funds. There simply does not exist a chain of title transfer linking those public roads, libraries and other institutions to a tax paying collective, nor could there be any such a link. This is because public property implies a contradiction as explained earlier. It is pointed out also by Hoppe that because of the differing meanings of free trade and free immigration, that free immigration might not be mutually beneficial. But whether immigration is mutually beneficial or whether some random third party is pissed off by the immigration is entirely irrelevant. 
The same is true, after all, for free trade. That some third party is pissed off that John and Sarah are trading fish does not imply that this third party's rights are being violated. Similarly, just because some third party is pissed off about a Mexican, Pakistani or Martian immigrant moving to rural Siberia has absolutely no bearing on the issue of rights. Law and legal analysis is concerned with only those situations where there is conflict. Nobody owns rural Siberia, and thus there can be no conflicts over its use. With that in mind, Hopper presents his argument as follows. There can be shipments, immigrants, without willing domestic recipients. In this case, immigrants are foreign invaders, and immigration represents an act of invasion. Surely, a government's basic protective function includes the prevention of foreign invasions and the expulsion of foreign invaders. Now, if the government excludes a person while there exists a domestic recipient who wants to admit this very person onto his property, the result is forced exclusion. And if the government admits a person while there exists no domestic resident who wants to have this person on his property, the result is forced integration. But the question must be asked of exactly who this invasion is against. The tax paying collective? There is no such thing as a collective property right, and as such, an immigrant using public roads and highways is not per se invading against any individual taxpayer. There is also the easy counterexample of an immigrant moving to rural Siberia. As mentioned earlier, nobody owns rural Siberia, and as such, this immigrant needs nobody's permission to go there. Moreover, if restricted immigration is to be used as a label for free immigration, sans those instances where the immigration is aggressive, then we must also use restricted immigration in those instances of rape, murder, and other such crimes. On this view, to be anti-rape or murder is to be in favour of closed or at least restricted borders. It is the claim that me moving my knife from outside of your body to inside of your body makes me rightly classed as an illegal alien or immigrant. This is clearly well outside the normal understanding of what a national border consists of and forms nothing more than a mot to the bailey of taxpayer socialism. This bailey is highlighted specifically in what Anglo-Libertarian dubs the homeless question. Consider Dave Smith taking his children to the local state-run park. There he sees a bump who has homesteaded one of the climbing frames as a nice platform to take his narcotics. It is assumed for the purposes of the scenario that the bum does not pay any taxes towards the upkeep of the playground, and Dave Smith does. The question is, does Dave Smith have a right to exclude the bum from using the park? Those in the taxpayer socialism camp claim that Dave Smith has a greater right to the park than the bum because of the taxes he has paid towards the upkeep and construction of the park. But this surely cannot be the case. There does not exist a chain of title transfer making Dave Smith the owner of this park, nor could he communally own it with every other taxpayer. Those taxes were robbed from him. This does not transfer title to anything. Moreover, surely Dave Smith's claim is indeed greater than the one the government has, but not greater than the one the bum has, who has actually homesteaded that part of the park. Homesteaders have the property right, rather than any random latecomer. If Dave Smith doesn't own the park, and neither does the state, our theory must rightly treat it as unowned until such a time that someone comes along and homesteads part or all of it. The homeless bum has done just that. Allow me to analyse this claim more broadly. The taxpayer socialist says not only that taxpayers have a greater claim than non-taxpayers, but also that in the meantime, these taxpayer-funded possessions ought to be run as if they were owned privately. Any argument about what the solution is in the meantime is fundamentally flawed because what is legal now does not become illegal in the future, and what is illegal now does not become legal in the future. It is either the case that immigration should be free or restricted. It cannot be anything else. It cannot be that the correct answer now is closed borders, but in the nebulous future, natural law flips and the correct answer becomes open borders. It is pointed out in this discussion by those in the Hopper camp that we don't live in a perfect libertarian society, we live in a status one, as if this observation is of any substance or changes anything about the argument whatsoever. Indeed, we do not live in that libertarian society, and as such, we should be advocating a strict adherence to natural law. Closed borders and restricted immigration are criminal, and thus must be strongly opposed. With that in mind, Angler presents his argument that, in the meantime, public possessions ought be run as if they are privately owned, as follows. I am going to defend the view of Hans Hermann Hoppe, that this property can be justly steered towards emulating the likely management which would occur if it was held privately, as opposed to being left entirely up to the discretion of petty local council politicians. That the ends it should be steered towards are that of a low time preference libertarian social order and away from a hedonistic leftist egalitarian one. And that the ones who do the steering are the taxpayers, who by their position of having their money forcibly taken to maintain this illegitimately held property, they have a preference in its use and management over those who do not have money forcibly taken for it. But this thesis is a complete non-starter, because it is literally impossible to determine what the tax-paying collective wants to do with the property. Maisie showed us this with his impossibility thesis against socialism. The only viable method I see is to survey the entire tax-paying collective and to try and achieve a unanimous opinion on how the public possession should 
should be run. Insofar as there's any disagreement, no matter how small, between even two taxpaying funders of a park, all that can be done is to make a completely arbitrary choice over who is to win this conflict. This is nothing more than legal positivism. It is a complete abandonment of the naturalistic thesis which it is presented as. For this reason, a taxpaying collective simply cannot come to acquire a collective property right in anything. And thus the correct answer to this homeless question is that it is the homeless bum who has committed the heroic act of wrestling control of this socialist possession away from the state who is to be considered its proper owner. Nothing else will do. After all, it could very well be the case that every single taxpayer who funded some local park is indeed an egalitarian leftist. You can imagine such a scenario arising in the various suburbs of San Francisco and other Democrat strongholds. In such a scenario, would the Hoppians still maintain that the possession be steered in a direction to bring low time preference? This would contradict the starting point that it should be up to the collective to decide how it should be run. What we come to on this point is Hoppian sporting democracy, the god that works only in this case. Per Hoppe, we know that any democratically run institution must tend towards high time preference. Thus, if the taxpaying collective is to decide their will via democratic means, the Hoppian must respect this tendency towards the high time preference socialist egalitarian society that they so deeply despise. If we were to instead take the stance that we should run public institutions as we can reasonably assume a private property owner would, this justifies all manner of evil and violent restrictions done by the state. There is a great deal of time during which most private citizens would absolutely despise having an unmasked or unvaccinated person on their property. Thus can the state reasonably assume that vaccine and mask mandates are what people want. Most private property owners would not want you smoking cigarettes or shooting up heroin on their property. Thus can the state use this as a justification to ban those things. Heck, most private property owners wouldn't even want you to possess various hard drugs on their property. Thus can the state use this to ban possession of these things on public possessions. This would in effect completely ban the drugs outright. The only alternative to the taxpaying collective demonstrating their will via democratic vote is to pick some arbitrary individual to say what this collective wants without any reference to their actual stated opinion on this matter. This is a complete rejection of the premise that these possessions ought be run as the taxpaying collective wants. The correct solution, again, is that these possessions ought be brought under the exclusive control of heroic homesteaders, such as the drunk bum who uses the park for his own purposes. Anglo rejects this application of homesteading, stating the following. Acknowledging that state property does not actually have a legitimate owner, it could be considered exactly the same as abandoned property. At that point, it can be homesteaded by the first person who gets there and wants to claim it. So if a hobo sleeps in a state-owned kid's playground, they have homesteaded the available property and become the rightful owner. But here's a problem with that as a solution. The government does not give a shit about the rightful homestead principle, and to be honest, neither does the hobo. It is quite absurd to imagine walking up to a drug adult half-conscious homeless person and saying to them, how do you do fellow libertarian? I see you've done a mighty fine job homesteading this vacant property. Would you like to trade my pen for one of your cigarettes? And then getting an intelligible response back from them. Then after that, the government would just enforce its illegitimate claim and kick them out anyway, and you've achieved nothing. My point there doesn't refute the homestead principle theory, it only calls it impractical and useless under current conditions. But the homestead principle also does not refute my point that a taxpayer has a greater claim than a non-taxpayer. While the government does enforce its illegitimate claims, this emulation is the best way to start working towards creating a society where the homestead principle is actually used and respected. If we don't take these steps, then it will remain useless, and these steps are supported by the just principle of differing strengths in property rights claims. First, whether the government or the hobo actually understands the homestead principle in explicit terms is entirely irrelevant to the rights of the case. Surely our property theory extends also to those people who do not understand it yet, as these people can still have conflicts. So the homeless bum may not be intellectually capable of explicating the non-aggression principle or describing the praxeologic foundations of law, but he still has property right in those things that he initially possesses just the exact same way that 2 and 2 make 4 whether anyone is aware of this fact or not. Also, whether the government will end up enforcing their illegitimate claim is entirely irrelevant to the question of whether or not the homeless person's claim was legitimate or not. The question is this, would some random taxpayer have a right to exclude this homeless person from the park? If they do have this right, then this random taxpayer, who is a latecomer to the park, is said to be the proper owner of that park, and nobody else is. We see here the problem with Anglo's analysis. He says that his point is not a refutation of the homestead principle and the homestead principle is not a refutation of his point, but these two principles are clearly completely incompatible. Either the homesteader is said to be the owner, or some random taxpayer is. It is also not made clear by Anglo or anyone else to my knowledge how exactly it's the case that taxpayers have a greater claim than non-taxpayers. This may seem like an intuitive solution, but a first principles derivation must be able to be derived if it is to be included in any rational legal theory. 
nothing less will do. It is also worth attacking the strategic point made by Hopkins, Anglo included. If you had a button in front of you and every time you pressed it, $1 million were diverted from the ATS budget to fund government housing, what would you do? If you wouldn't press it, or at least press it as many times as it took so that all the computers, AC, vehicles and police equipment in all of the ATF offices across the US had to be removed, leaving the agency completely unable to function, then quite frankly, you are useless to the libertarian cause. And unless you removed every single dollar from the ATS budget, you are hardly much use at all. If we don't do this, then we are a movement that will never actually do any moving until our objectives are already achieved. How do you achieve your objective when you refuse to move towards it? That's anyone's guess. We can ponder as much as we like about the perfect way that things should be done, but we can fall into the trap of only doing this rather than also looking outside at the imperfect world and trying to make it better. If something can be done with the government property whilst it is illegitimately held, we need to explore what is preferable and to what ends. This point fails on the grounds that it is a disanalogy. Pressing the button to divert funds away from the ATF does not cause any extra aggressions. Having this Hoppian management of public possessions does cause such extra aggressions when contrasted with the open borders stance of lack of management. This is a fundamental misunderstanding of strategy often found in neo prags and the like. The principle is that the role of strategy in planning is to denote which goals are more urgently required to be achieved, that is, which aggressions must more urgently be stopped. This presumes that the goal is stopping aggression not implementing further aggressions. Such an implementation of additional aggression is completely counterproductive in pushing for the very thing that the libertarian is trying to destroy. We are and must be libertarians, not liberty utilitarians. The difference is subtle, but dire. The liberty utilitarian completely destroys the cause in his warping of it. This undermines the goal of pushing a hardline natural rights philosophy onto the public consciousness. As Rothbard has pointed out, such individuals have a duty on their own premises to shut up and to pretend to be adherents of natural rights. There is also the argument that welfare makes a free immigration policy untenable, as explained by Hopper. According to proponents of unconditional free immigration, the US, qua high wage area, would invariably benefit from free immigration, hence it should enact a policy of open borders regardless of any existing conditions, i.e. even if the US were snarled in protectionism and domestic welfare. Yet surely, such a proposal strikes a reasonable person as fantastic. Assume that the US, or better still Switzerland, declared that there would no longer be any border controls, that anyone who could pay the fare might enter the country and, as a resident, then be entitled to every normal domestic welfare provision. Can there be any doubt about how disastrous such an experiment would turn out in the present world? The US, and Switzerland even faster, would be overrun by millions of third world immigrants because life on and off American and Swiss public streets is comfortable compared to life in many areas of the third world. Welfare costs would skyrocket and the strangled economy would disintegrate and collapse as the subsistence fund, the stock of capital accumulated in and inherited from the past, was plundered. Civilization in the US and Switzerland would vanish, just as it once did from Rome and Greece. Since unconditional free immigration must be regarded as a prescription for national suicide, the typical position among free traders is the alternative of conditional free immigration. According to this view, the US and Switzerland would have to first return to unrestricted free trade and abolish all tax funded welfare programs, and only then should they open their borders to anyone who wanted to come. In the meantime, while the welfare state is still in place, immigration would have to be made subject to the condition that immigrants are excluded from domestic welfare entitlements. But such an argument applies equally to children, who can be viewed as immigrants from Storkistan. It is surely abhorrent to advocate that the state impose restrictions on births until welfare is abolished. We must, as legal scholars, separate the crime of taxing citizens for welfare and the crime of restricting immigration. It may well be strategically beneficial to focus your efforts on removing welfare first, but it is not legally justifiable to keep immigration restrictions in place until this goal is achieved. Moreover, if the Hopian is to be annoyed by non-tax paying bums and foreigners on his public streets, is it not proper for him to endorse a stance that tax evasion is criminal? If it is the tax paying collective who jointly own all of the land in the United States, is it not proper for them to endorse deporting the tax evaders, the bums and the children? This this example makes it clear that Hopians are placing the blame with those heroic enough to violate state edicts. This is a strange stance for supposed anarchists. As anarchists, we must adopt a hardline natural rights philosophy, and to learn such a philosophy, you have to watch this video where I explain that anarcho-capitalism is the solution to law. 